welcome everybody to our Cornwall Conservation Trust presentation, Who's Slinking Around in Our Woods, by Dr. Lawrence Master, who is a conservation biologist and zoologist, and in his retirement, a conservation photographer. Um, after his doctoral and po uh, postdoctoral studies at the U University of Michigan, Dr. Master spent 20 years at the Nature Conservancy and six years with NatureServe, most of the time as their chief zoologist. He's an author, having co-authored Rivers of Life, Crit Critical Watersheds for Protecting Freshwater Biodiversity, and authored numerous other publications, as well as chapters in several books. Um, um, uh, Dr. Master resides in Key, New York, and as is our good fortune in West Cornwall, Connecticut, and today is reaching us from Venice, Florida. We're lucky to have him share his perspective on uh, night cams today. And um, uh, we really enjoy him bringing his uh, photographic expertise to our town so we can uh, participate with similar kinds of enjoyment. So I'm just going to turn this over to Larry right away, but let me just tell you that um, I try to mute everyone and we will, I will address most questions in the chat, just throw them in the chat and I'll give them um, to Larry afterwards. But then if we have a little time at the end, we'll have an open discussion and then you can unmute. So with that, Larry, go ahead and show us what you've got in store. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen here. So it's love starting. Okay, can everybody see my title? Looks great. Great. All right. So I'm going to start. So the title, as Catherine said, is Who's Slicking Around in Our Woods? And this is really a two part uh, presentation. The first part will be the ways to know about that. And the second uh, part of this will be uh, some trail cameras and how I use them each about half of the time. So, so first of all, how to see, oops, I'm gonna move, there we go. Something happened. So, okay, first birds, uh, those are relatively easy to see and find uh, by sight or sound. Um, Frogs and toads, also relatively easy when they're breeding in the spring, you hear them or, or see them on rainy roads in the evening. Salamanders are more difficult. You have to kind of go to the vernal pools in the spring or look under logs and litter or slowly drive in wet roads in the spring, which you want to do anyway because of frogs and toads crossing the roads. Turtles, uh, it's really easy to see and find them if they're basking, but a lot of turtles don't bask and require sort of a focused type of searching. Snakes are quite difficult. You have to be lucky and run into them or do focus searching by turning over cover and so on. And finally, fishes, uh, unless, except for the ones you catch on a fly rod, uh, really require seining, of course, with a permit in streams and lakes. So how do you identify how, what you see in here? Um, and you're in luck if you have a smartphone. I grew up with field guides, the Pearson field guides, of paper, and they were wonderful. That's how I learned to identify birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians. But now there's all sorts of aids to identify things uh, on the computer. You can go on the internet to bugguide.net and send them any pictures of insects you take. And it's crowdsourced. There's thousands of people on bug guide and they typically somebody will identify your unknown insect within hours, if not a day or two. Naturalist.org, which is also crowdsourced, and they will identify almost any picture you send to them. Uh, they do really well with uh, fungi and uh, mammals and, and herps and plants and so on. And then there's smartphone apps. Uh, there are electronic field guides. I use one by David Sibley for birds. There's lots of other ones out there as well. There's an app called Seek which connects to iNaturalist. And if you take a picture with your smartphone of, of a fungus or uh, almost anything, it will identify it. And it does a pretty good job. Uh, not as good as some things, but it's pretty good. And, and whatever it's not sure about, it will send to iNaturalist for you. If 
if you if you click a button and send to a naturalist and then you'll hear back from my naturalists that were just a crowdsourced uh, application group then there's merlin which is miraculous uh it's been the uh, long uh sought thing by cornell ornithologists to uh, have an app that identifies birds by sound as well as by images and cornell has this enormous library of bird images as well as sounds and so they They've uh, put it all in the computer uh, <laughs> with artificial intelligence. And uh, now there's this app, which is free. And you can turn on sound ID. And it's about 95% accurate, in my experience, identifying everything that's singing or calling around you. It's, it's quite miraculous. It's a wonderful thing to kind of just carry with you with Merlin turned on and see what's uh, singing out there. And then there's an app, which I love for plants. I think it's a little more accurate than uh, and seek uh, for identifying plants. And again, it's really, really easy to use. Uh, it even identifies the trees by their bark, uh, as well as just almost any plant you come across. So that's that's a really nice one to have on your phone. So what about mammals? I haven't talked about mammals so far. Well, some are mostly diurnal, that is they're active during the day and easy to see if they're large enough, like Eastern gray squirrel and the chipmunk. Uh, what about other mammals? Well, some of them are at least partially diurnal or crepuscular, that is active at dawn or dusk. But at some seasons and in some locales, they may be mostly nocturnal. That makes it difficult. So here are the ones that can be sort of active during the day sometimes and mostly nocturnal, like the Eastern Cottontail, beavers, these were photographed on Cogswell Road, porcupine, this was photographed on Lake Road, red fox, gray fox, uh, otter, these occur in the Housatonic drainage, and mink uh, with a brown trout. These are all found in our area. Uh, and they're, they tend to be active sometimes during the day, but often they're quite nocturnal. Black bears, these are on Lake Road in our backyard, a little family of them. And then my favorite local animal, favorite animal in the Northeast probably, the bobcat. This was in our backyard in Lake Road. This was also there. Two, di two different bobcats. They're just gorgeous animals. And this is a family of coyotes. All these are mostly, oh, here's one more. This is at our back door in, on Lake Road, a raccoon coming to look for a handout, which it didn't get. <laughs> you don't want to feed raccoons. They'll never stop coming. Oh, and this is a skunk also in our backyard on Lake Road. So again, these are animals that are mostly nocturnal, I would say, but also you can find them during the day. And of course, all these pictures were taken during the day. And then finally, uh, one that's uh, a little less common here, but more common up on the north woods, and that's the, the uh, fisher. This is a young fisher. So what about small mammals? Uh, some of these are nocturnal, others are active around the clock, but mostly out of sight, and so require really specialized trapping or viewing techniques, such as an infrared scope. So here are three of the four most common animals, mammals, that is, in the northeast. Uh, the, Deer mouse or white-footed mouse on the left. It's in everybody's houses and garages and barns. It's uh, in never-ending numbers on these guys. So I'm, I'm loath to uh, snap them, kill them with snap traps and instead I use box traps mostly. The upper right is a northern short-tailed shrew, which you sometimes see around bird feeders in the winter, but otherwise you hardly ever see them. And then perhaps the most common mammal in the Northeast is the mass shrew. I, I would venture to say almost nobody on this call has seen one because they're mostly hiding in the leaf litter. Uh, they're active around the clock. They have to eat every a couple of hours because they have such a high metabolic rate. They're, they're very small. They weigh, they weigh, you know, probably the same, maybe two or three or four grams, very light. But again, they're very hard to see and you have to use specialized techniques with live traps to try and see one. So, how might we determine what some of the larger and mostly nocturnal mammals might be in our woods, like bobcats, coyotes, skunks, porcupines, rabbits, foxes, fisher, uh, since they're uh, mostly nocturnal and it's rare to really see them during the day? Well, one way would be tracks and sign given proper conditions. Another way would be using infrared scope. So here's some typical tracks, uh, which are quite distinct. Uh, upper left's a raccoon with a much larger hind print and a smaller foreprint. Uh, and the top center is a fisher. This is a typical mustela, that is a weasel family track in pairs. So minks and weasels and fishers all have that same sort of pattern. Upper right, of course, it's a bear. It's really big, although you can't tell the size here. 
lower right, it's an interesting comparison of a bobcat track with a coyote track. The coyotes is a canid uh, dog family. And so dogs, coyotes, foxes all have the same type of print with claw marks showing. And I drew a red X there because you can draw an X like that through the print. Whereas in the bobcat on the upper right, it's very different. And there are no claw marks, of course, because it's a cat. And the, the uh, pad of the paw is rounded and four kind of toes like that. It's quite different looking. And a smaller, of course, than the coyote. Lower center is a red fox, prints in a straight line, really small, and deer mice on the mouse on the lower left. Typical tracks. And there's also a sign, otter slide here on the left, which you see in the snow sometimes or uh, on sandy banks or rivers. Upper right is a, can't tell the size here, but it's big, it's a bear poop. And then lower right could be deer or mountains, pellets, maybe very similar. So another way besides tracks and sign is to use an infrared scope. And this is a miraculous technology that allows you to see at night. The military has been using this for years, but uh, it's great for spotting mammals because uh, all mammals uh, radiate heat, uh, humans included at night. And so uh, even you can even see mice at night running around in the woods uh, or shrews uh, if you're close enough with an infrared scope. The one that's featured here actually costs about $3,000, which is typical. But there's a smaller, not so much smaller, but a much less expensive version that uh, a lot of um, mammal seeking people have used. Uh, it's much less expensive and it works, it works pretty well. But how else might we most easily and expensively determine what some of the most nocturnal mammals might be in our woods? And this is where I'm gonna talk about trail cameras. Finally, this talk was supposed to be about trail cameras, I think. <laughs> And they're really good. It's really good for medium size and larger mammals and birds. There's a wonderful book put out by Roland Case, who is a uh, associate professor at North Carolina State Museum of Natural History in North Carolina State. And uh, he put this out about uh, six years ago. And it's all about camera trapping. It's called Candid Critters. And he's also co-author of Mammals of North America, the best field guide out here put out by Princeton University Press. Uh, on the mammals of North America. I want to start out by re reading a quote from Roland from his Candid Creatures book. If you don't mind me reading this. He said, the world is alive with animals that we virtually never see with our own eyes. Most wildlife, especially mammals, hear or smells long before we see them. Some hide out in holes or thickets as we pass by. Others run away to avoid us before we can catch a glimpse. Many species are nocturnal, starting their activity right when we are winding down our day, hiding under the cover of darkness. The rarest and most elusive species live in remote corners of the world that are difficult to access. The near impossibility of seeing some wildlife species frustrates nature lovers and exasperates zoologists. How can we study or count animals we can't see? Some are rare and listed as endangered species. Others we know so little about we can't access them or assess them instead classifying them as data deficient. The scientist's solution to this problem is the camera trap, a motion sensitive camera that can be left alone in nature to quietly record photographs of any animals that pass by. So that's a really nice summary of why we do camera trapping. So Roland's book is full of stories about how incredibly useful trail cameras have been for conservation. For example, finding a bird in New Guinea thought to be extinct for the past 120 years. Uh, this particular chart shows a number of scientific articles that cite the use of camera traps from the year 2000 to the year 2014. And you can see it's just an exponential rise in the number of scientific articles where they use camera traps. And that, that, that it didn't start at, stop at 2014, it's just continuing today, that increase in the number of uh, scientists using camera traps for all sorts of studies, including uh, some very important for conservation purposes. So I started camera trapping about a dozen years ago in the Adirondacks. And at the time, the camera traps were not nearly as good as they are now. They were, didn't have very many mega, megapixels and so on. But here's just a few of my early attempts. Uh, a turkey in the backyard, a rough grouse flying, uh, an eagle and ravens uh, feasting on a deer carcass, I think it is, and then some ravens feasting on a carcass and some other camera trap photos from my early days of camera trapping, a uh, black bear, a fisher, uh, a snowshoe hare that's uh, in April, that's turning from white to brown. 
By the way, this is a, a, a thing that camera traps have been quite useful is to monitor when snowshoe hares are, are turning pellets, their pellets is turning from white to brown or brown to white because there's concern as snow cover diminishes in the northern woods that snowshoe hares will become vulnerable. Like this one is kind of stands out here, even though he's partially brown now uh, against the brown background. There's concern that, uh, you know, that might endanger some populations. But it turns out there's an enormous, I found my own camera trapping, that there's enormous variability in when individual snowshoe hares in one area will turn from brown to white or white to brown. So that bodes well. I mean, the ones that turn too soon or too late based on the diminishing snow cover will be in trouble, but there's lots of other ones in, in the population, maybe even the same litters that will survive uh, better than, than those. Some other animals here, red fox, northern gray fox, and a, a New England cottontail. So checking the camera trap card settings after the camera has been sitting out for days or weeks even, and I sometimes leave mine out for a couple of months without checking it, can be really exciting because unexpected animals show up and sort of unexpected stories are, are visible. And I'll give you some examples of those. One time I had a camera set up at a, uh, uh, by a, a wild boar carcass that some hunters had dumped and uh, the carcass got buried by snow and a red fox came and unburied it and it was there for a couple of months. And then one day in late March, a golden eagle shows up on its way north to Canada to breed. And the red fox was quite upset. And I have a series of photos where the red fox is uh, sort of standing off against this golden eagle. And the golden eagle only stayed around for about 10 minutes and then it left. I guess it got tired of fighting with the red fox. But that was the whole reason I'd had the camera there was actually to try and catch a golden eagle migration as part of a network of people monitoring golden eagles in the Northeast. Here's a series of photos in our backyard in Cornwall. Uh, notice the little white pine seedling there for, for positioning. So one day or one night rather, a raccoon shows up and kind of sniffs the ground right here. As you, as you may know, mammals have incredible senses of smell, much better than ours for the most part. So two days later, a striped skunk, notice it has a black tail. The reason I say that is you'll see in a minute, shows up and gets kind of interested in something, the smell of something in the ground and proceeds to dive head first <laughs> into the snow uh, to try and get whatever it smells down there. It came up empty and, and walked away, but precisely 27 minutes later, a little deer mouse pokes its head up through the hole that the <laughs> skunk had made, probably thinking to itself, wow, what happened there? Or maybe, wow, that was a lucky break or, or maybe it's all clear now, I don't know. Anyway, that was one lucky deer mouse. And then, okay, that was 27 minutes after the skunk had come through. Then 18 minutes later, a different skunk with a white tail and a white back comes and sticks its nose in the same place. Also smelling, presumably smelling the deer mouse. And as far as I know, the deer mouse escaped this second predation attempt as well. So that was sort of an interesting sequence of, of photos. So the camera just happened to be in the right spot for that. Uh, sometimes it's great to have videos. Unfortunately, this wasn't one, but in the spring, the snowshoe hares start chasing each other around during mating season. And this is the start of a chase, but uh, unfortunately it wasn't a video. So I just have this still. So here's uh, one of my first videos I took. I was trying to catch a bear taking, coming through a path that it normally took in the place I was living at in, in the Adirondacks. And I'll start the video. Here, look in the lower left corner. You're not going to see a bear here, but you're going to see a snowshoe hare slowly appearing on the screen. And uh, so that was an attempted predation of uh, you hear the turkeys in the background, the screaming of the snowshoe hare got the turkeys all upset. Uh, and there was a young red-tailed hawk that came in. But happily, you'll be happy to know for the snowshoe hare, the next day I found the hare again, quite alive and well, just with a torn ear. So the immature uh, red-tailed hawk was not successful in that particular predation event. Okay, another mis a mystery here. This is the first of several mysteries. Who was eating our porcupine? Was it a raccoon, squirrel? Uh, the porcupine, I mean, who's our, I think our pumpkin, I'm sorry, did I say porcupine, who's our pumpkin? So on the right-hand side, you can see I set up a camera on a tree, focused on the side of the uh, pumpkin that had the hole in it, 
to see what, what in the heck might be doing this. And sure enough, it came back the next day. And there's our culprit. I'll keep this on just for a second so you can see it's uh, not quite done yet. Every day the hole got bigger and bigger. So we left the pumpkin out for a while. Okay, that was one mystery that was solved by a camera trap. Second mystery. Somebody, something was draining our hummingbird feeders every night up in the Adirondacks. <clears throat> I had a suspicion as to what it was, but we set up a camera trap to try and catch the culprit. And you can already see what the culprit was. It's kind of ignoring the bird feeders, which have a sizzling heat bird seed that mammals don't like because it's got peppers in it. But it's coming, approaching the hummingbird feeder. And it's just going to empty it. <laughs> and there was sugar water all over the juniper there every every morning. So that was that was one mystery solved. <clears throat> and then also uh, years ago, I lived in, in the Placid in the Adirondacks, and I had strung up uh, four or five uh, bird feeders up on a string strung between two trees. And the string was way up where I had to fill the feeders by by using a ladder. And the reason I did that is to keep the bears from reaching the bird feeders. And that worked for at least a couple of years. And then all of a sudden one night, all the bird feeders were knocked down on the ground. I said, my heck, what's going on here? How did that happen? So I set up a trail camera and here's what happened. The so bear climbed the tree and then hung full body weight from the rope and the weight letting go of the rope sprung the rope up and knocked all the feeders off. He may have had to do it a couple of times, but he knocked every feeder off. And so I solved that problem by instead of using a rope between two trees, by using a cable. And then he, his, his weight didn't have any effect on the cable and that was the end of that particular problem. So as I mentioned, uh, I use sizzle and heat, we use sizzle and heat birdseed with chili peppers to discourage mammals. Some squirrels eventually get used to it sometimes, but it, Bears usually will taste it and then they uh, they go away, don't come back. So come on, get out of here. Okay, look right now. I stopped the video. See down below on the grass, it's got three really cute little cubs. I mean, they're just really cute looking. So I'm walking out with my cell phone. Stop. I growled, trying to discourage. That didn't have many effect. I was trying to encourage him there a little bit. And there he goes. Okay, this other bear here, this is in our backyard in Cornwall. Uh, the camera traps are uh, attached by, a, by a, to a post or to a tree with a strap. And this bear just took a dislike to the strap. I, had, I think I had a video originally, but I must have taken these stills out of the video. And so you can see it pulling on the strap and it's trying to chew the trap. Anyway, it didn't, at least it didn't chew the camera. Okay, here's a, one of my first videos, actually not one of my first ones, only two years ago in, uh, in Cornwall, across the street from where we live on Lake Road. And uh, I have a species, I have a video of mixed species crossing this path right here, but I couldn't find it. But I, I did find a vid, composite video of uh, my favorite Cornwall animal going back and forth, the bobcat. These are all the separate videos I've knit together. There's water running somewhere there in the gully underneath. That's the noise. It is at 10 in the morning, but sometimes they're out and about during the day. 
eight thirty in the morning, two in the afternoon. seven in the morning on the lake. So trail cameras, my goodness, there's a whole lot of different kinds, hundreds of makes and models. Are, uh, today I went on Amazon, there were over 800 hits, right? Entered trail camera or entered camera trap. And so it's a mind boggling and they keep getting better by the way, better megapixels, better resolution, so on and so forth. Uh, so how do you choose? So here are the features that I look for in a trail camera. First of all, good reviews by reviewers, uh, no serious negative reviews, a reasonable price. And the price keeps going down, by the way. I'll demonstrate that in a minute. High quality images, and they keep getting better. The quality keeps improving. And by high quality, I mean a, a high megapixel count, which is not everything, but it's important. Uh, HD, high definition video. Performs well both day and night. Some do well during the day and not at night, and vice versa. At night, they can. Some cameras have both infrared and flash. You can choose between the two. Uh, ideally, they want to sense movement at a distance, although you know things are too far away. It's not much of a of a picture or a video. A close focusability is useful, and not all of them do that, but one I will show you shortly does. And ideally a fast trigger speed and recovery time. You don't want it to take a long time to recover. And most of them don't. Most of them are, are pretty fast these days. So here are the two that I've been using recently. The one on the left is about three megapixels. The one on the right is much smaller, but it comes with two close focus lenses that you can focus to either 18 or 24 inches. And I'll show you how that's really useful uh, sometimes. And the other one is not close focus, but it takes really nice pictures or relatively nice pictures. So here's a setup I use for a bird bath up in the Adirondacks uh, with the camera I just showed you on the right with a close focus. Uh, the bird bath is, uh, is at or near ground level. That's probably not critical. There's a dripper, which isn't shown in this picture, I don't think. But I, I use a dripper made by uh, Duncraft, which continuously drips water into the bird bath and uh, is a really a magnet for birds. And the camera is at eye level. This is important whether you're taking a trail camera or a regular camera. You, you want to try and be at eye level with your subject in any, almost any animal picture you take. It just makes for a much more appealing picture. So here's a video, this is about a one minute video at that setup I just showed you. And I'll just let this run for a minute. This is the first time I've ever seen a hummingbird take a bath. <laughs> Maybe you had, but I, I hadn't seen this before. Not really a bath, but sort of. The water's pretty deep, so it's not going to get in very deep. Washing is tushy there. BB. That's a quick dunk. Taking a drink first before it takes a bath. Blue jays are very serious about their baths, very thorough. Dripping sparrow. Forge bird. Looks like it's already taken a bath and it's shaking itself, but it's not quite done yet. A male purple fence, female purple fence. Goldfinch, not bothered by the purple finches, although they tried to bother it.
the female bluebird. He seems particularly interested in the dripping. Male American robin, dark head. Red squirrel. And finally, chipmunk. I mean, sorry, chicken, black cat, chicken. Okay, now we're down in Florida, and I'm going to show you two uh, setups down here uh, on the, uh, the tree or the um, Scrub on the right is a, is a cabbage palmetto with a red tape on it. And I had a camera on there, which is not, it's not on there in this picture, but I took some video with that. And I've also taken video with a camera on the ground on the left by the bird bath. And I'll show you a video from, from each set of videos from each one. So here's the first one, the very hesitant gray squirrel. This is right after I first put the water out. And the gray squirrel is not quite sure to make of that crock. Some of the animals don't pay much attention to it. They just happen to wander through the picture. Lots of rabbits around, cottontails. That's a native rat from the woods next door. And then finally, somebody who's actually interested in drinking. A neighborhood raccoon, neighborhood possum. Yellow species that's found now throughout the Southeast. Oh, here's our beloved late dog, Toby. And sometimes animals really cooperate, the big ones. This is coyote, of course, bobcat. They're just gorgeous animals. Okay. Now, so here's the close up camera. This is camera's about 18 inches away from the bird bath and I'll show you a video we took with that one. I'm turning up the volume because it's, you want to hear what's going to happen here in a minute. BB taking another quick dip. One of our morning doves. Here's a southern species, the common ground dove, beautiful bird. Checking out the camera. Great cat bird is about to be displaced by that female red bellied woodpecker that's now going to. Take a drink. You hear that noise in the background? That's a blue jay imitating a red shouldered hawk. And they do that to try and uh, scare birds away from either food or apparently from a bird bath. You hear that just happened again, and it's about to displace this palm warbler. Red shoulder hawks are really common down here. Blue jays so much hate them quite a bit. Now the palm warbler is going to have a bath without being displaced. It's already been in once and it's going to go in again. One of our cottontails at night. Coyote not crock waiting. Ah, 
This is why the close-up camera is not usually very good for big mammals, but this one actually cooperated, as you'll see in a minute. Okay, so the future of camera trapping. Well, it's here now if you want to spend the money. And that is a, a company called Cognesis for the last uh, seven or eight years has developed um, camera boxes that are waterproof in which you can stick a regular digital single lens reflex camera and take a pretty amazing pictures like you could if you were just using it without a trail camera box. So the way it works is there's a, uh, there's, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but there's red and blue boxes. One is for a video camera, one's for a still camera, but you could have one box that does both. Then there's flashes, there's video lights for video work, and there's flashes for still pictures. And then the key part is this is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, beam sensor. So when an animal walks across the beam, or uh, it'll trigger the cameras, which will either take video or still, depending how you have it set up. And to give you some example, some pictures that Roy Dunn, who uh, did this, um, has done up. This is right outside of Los Angeles. These are all cougars uh, looking over the landscape of Los Angeles. Uh, and he's gotten lots and lots of pictures, mostly of one family of cougars up there in the, in the hills above Los Angeles. And these are some other pictures that Roy has taken uh, up there and, and elsewhere. Uh, bobcat, long-eared owl, um, mule deer, uh, bobcat, uh, bats flying, and then a bee up close. It's really, this actually works really well for insect photography as well. You just, again, have to have a macro lens. So I think that's all. I've got to say, I'm, what I'm going to do is turn the sound down to, to nothing. I hope you can still hear me. I just turned it down the video. Can you hear me still? Yeah. Catherine? Yep. I hear you. Oops. Catherine, can you hear me? Anybody? I, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. How about if I turn my volume down? Can you still hear me? Yes. Sound still good. So Susan Claw wants to know why bobcats are your favorite. Uh, I just think they're beautiful. <laughs> I, I, I just love bobcats. Uh, for their, I just think they're gorgeous animals. <laughs> and uh, a question from Tom Blagden here. Um, do you or anyone you know use a professional cognesis camera trap system? Yeah, several people I know use it. I mean, I know Roy Dunn, whose photos I showed. Uh, Melissa Gru, who lives down in the Ithaca area, uh, uses one. Uh, a fellow I've just been in touch with in North Carolina, uh, I can put his website somewhere, has taken just remarkable pictures um, with one of these Cognesis systems. There's a, there's a less expensive version out there, but it's not quite as good, I don't think, as Cognesis. A Cognesis setup, if you just have the set it up for, um, for flash and so on, will run you about $2,000. So it's not cheap. Plus, you, of course, you have to have the camera <laughs> to go in the trap. And you maybe you want to have a second camera, not use your very best camera. But I mean, it, it is waterproof, and I think it's it's fine that way. But again, you're, you're tying up a camera, putting the camera trap. So you really need a second camera if you already have a single lens reflex. I have a couple of questions. Other people as well. oh, I have a couple of questions about settings. I was noticing the uh, jump between images when you had a series, and I guess that's either the delay or the time lapse setting. H how do you decide what your delay setting or what your time lapse setting should be? Uh, I I just arbitrarily use thirty seconds as the uh, my duration and the thirty seconds between photos. But what I've done here is I, if I trim the photos down, I mean the videos down, I'm sorry, to you know 10 to 20 seconds typically. Uh, 
and some some of the video 30 second videos are, are mostly black you know the animal will, bird will come in then it'll leave and the rest of the video was black so i trimmed them and then i stitched them all together uh with a program on my computer by the way i'll start this video just to have it going in the background uh because if it doesn't if the sound isn't too bad I might try and turn the sound down if it doesn't turn me my sound down too much. We aren't hearing the sound of the video. Okay. So this this will run for about seven minutes. So we can just ask questions in the background. I just thought I'd run this in the, at the end, and it's a different video than I showed before. Yeah. This is the a uh, bird bath up in Keene, New York. That's we, wonderful. There's slightly different species like pine siskins here, for example. Oh, there's some sound. Good. They're very social birds, as you can see. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, I don't have anything else in the chat. So um, go ahead and just uh, ask away if you have one. Well, I do. This is this is Betty standing behind her husband. Um, uh, so, so Larry, did you look up about hummingbirds taking baths? Did you find out if it's something that was a real rarity? I think we just don't see it. I didn't, I haven't looked it up. No, I just haven't. You know, been around bird baths looking for hummingbirds coming, uh, and the camera trap just happened to catch it this one time. So I don't know how frequent it is, but. I, yeah, I guess they need to take baths like all the rest of the birds once in a while. They like to. We don't have any gray squirrels where we are in Keene, but we had one hanging around for a while. Mostly we have red squirrels and chipmunks. It's a goldfinch in comparison, but the siskins, plain breasted, siskins are all striped. Otherwise, they're very close. Closely related. Oh, someone asks um, to see the slide again. Well, I guess when you're finished with your video uh, that shows the websites that are useful for ID. I think she means um, not so much the websites, but the apps and the and the. Um, yeah, I guess some of them are websites. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll go back to that. You want to do an hour to wait till the video is over? Oh, let's, well, let's wait for the end of your video and then, but maybe you want to, uh, you know, when we uh, end on a slide, maybe we should end on that slide. Yeah, the video's got another four or five minutes to go, I think four minutes maybe. Um, there's a question here asking if the gray fox population has gone down or they seem to have uh, diminished, says Denise Dermo. You know, Demo, well, my sorry. experience is in the Adirondacks, and and a hundred years ago, great fox did not occur in the Adirondacks. They were southern species that sort of moved north, and in, and where, I, where we live in Keene and Lake Placid area, they've actually increased in number. And uh, when the red fox and great fox come together, it's my understanding that great foxes are dominant. And in fact, the foxes now in the villages of uh, Lake Placid and Saranac Lake in the Adirondacks are great foxes. Um, I watched a den of one under a uh, somebody's deck uh, where they raised young. Another one uh, is under a shed in somebody's yard. Again, this is right in the village of Lake Placid. And so my impression is that they're increasing, at least in the villages, if not elsewhere. Um, and unlike red foxes, they can climb trees. Some of you may, may know that. But I don't, I don't know about Connecticut if they're increasing or decreasing there. It wouldn't surprise me if they are doing fine. Do you have to plug in that dripper? The the uh, it's the attached to a long yeah it comes to a long black small hose that just plug that goes into a you know an outlet a, a hose outlet and it's about thirty feet long so it can go for that was a downy woodpecker it goes for some distance and uh, you have to you can adjust it either where it connects to the outlet or there's a little wheel at the right off screen here that uh, you can adjust the dripping so you're not. So it's just dripping now and again, uh, constantly. There's a Junko, lots of Siskins. Uh, 
Uh, Natty Bumpo says, twice when I've been watering flowers in my garden with a fine spray, a ruby-throated hummingbird would deliberately fly into the, to the spray. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So they do like to take a little bath now and again. That must have been exciting when that happened. There's an evening grow speak, a, a rare visitor to our. Oh, wow. Bed. Showy. They've increased the last couple of years. There's been a spruce budworm outbreak in Canada, and that's increased the population of evening grow speaks. And there, there were quite a few this winter in the Adiron North, North Woods, the Adirondacks, coming to people's feeders. Hi, Larry. This is John Bevins. I have a question. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, have you had any experience with the uh, the cameras that have a cellular connection so you can see what's going on uh, on a camera that's way far away? You know, I haven't. I, I know some of them do that, uh, but I haven't. I haven't any experience myself direct with that. No. Oh, thanks. I've been tempted to do that, by the way, because it would be nice to see what's uh, to check, but then, you know, that would take a lot of time, it seems to me. To, you know, here's a chipmunk eating the, the uh, aster mm -hmm. Wonderful video. How about it? It's about a minute from the end, it looks like. Yeah, I'm not sure how the cognitive system with a regular single lens reflex would be that bit much better than this, frankly. I'm, I'm pretty happy with these videos. Robin is very thorough cleaning itself. <laughs> Cleaning its primaries. Now, what's the delay setting on that series of that Robin? Well, it was it was at least two thirty second videos put together. Because the Robin, and then so it was there for thirty seconds in between. So it must have been there for at least a minute and a half or two minutes, because uh, it would be a, a thirty-second gap in there where it wasn't taking a video. Okay. So, yeah. So it's a, they're all thirty-second videos that I've trimmed or put together. All and they've all been put together in this, but well, it's one program I've got. Now I think it's over, so I can stop sharing screen and go back to that one. So you get to set your photo burst also. So in other words, you can say that you only want it to go for four shots or go for, is that right? Is that yeah, how that when works? Yeah, when I do stills, I do three shots typically. Oh, three but I'm shots. Not doing, I haven't done stills now for a couple of years because I just find it so much more fun to look at videos. So no, I see. We, I'm trying to find the uh, slide here and then I'll share it again. Is there anything else about um, particular camera settings that you want to explain? Um, um, mine has. I use the highest thing. resolution I could use on, on, for both video and stills. Um, I personally do 30 second videos. I could do less because usually it's only interesting for maybe 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, but I don't mind taking 30 seconds and then trimming it down. Uh, what else? There's no other particular settings. You know, I, I make, try and make sure that the, uh, that the time is set accurately, uh, which it wasn't on the series of, of uh, skunk and pictures in the backyard. I just took out the time because it was, it said it was the afternoon and of course it was the middle of the night sometime. Um, no, I think that's about it. Nothing special. There's 
There are good manuals that come with these. Oh, by the way, that the one camera, not the one that takes close up with the other one, uh, I picked that up for $19 on Amazon about three weeks ago, the second one, because my first one had died after a couple of years. Uh, it was eating batteries, which it shouldn't do. And it was on sale. I don't know why it was only $19. So I picked one up and a friend of mine got one at the same time. Uh, and now it's back up to $60, which is still pretty reasonable. Huh. Uh, so they're not that expensive. Um, a decent trail camera. It used to be much more. I, I remember paying a couple hundred dollars for some of the earlier ones that came out, the Moultries and the Brownells brown and so on. So I think this is the page that people wanted to see with some, they're not really links on here, but there's names of, of uh, websites, bugguide.net, iNaturalist, and then the, the apps that are wonderful to have on your phone. Yeah. I mean, I use Seek Merlin picture for this all the time. I use Sibley a lot just as a, a field guide. Instead of having to carry a book around, it's in, the, in my phone. Plus, it has sounds. Uh, all the birds in Sibley's electronic field guide on my phone have four or five or six different calls and songs associated with it. So that's nice to have. Very good. I had this little Primos hunting camera and it's, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a, for a while I had a, a, a one that was 50 or 60 X a little pocket camera. And it wasn't, you know, as good as a single lens reflex, but it took decent pictures, good telephoto shots. But the new iPhones, the new smartphones are really pretty nice. And you can edit right on the phone. Uh, I use I use my phone for all my landscape shots and almost all my plant shots, and some you know close up shots of lizards and so on, mm -hmm. spiders. Well, I think this is a really great start all get going with this this information thank you so much sure yeah six o'clock so i guess we should think about ending this but uh, thank you all for coming and listening and I guess all questions. yep yep thank you everybody for coming i but and thank you larry i i think that this is really um everything you need to get going on this and you've shown us such great examples um of ways to have fun with it, with bird bass and night cameras and all kinds of things. This has been just perfect. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. All right. Well, until the next program, everybody, thanks for coming. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>